Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jessica Flood, Managing Director of Live Events for The New York Times, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to our very first New York Times Food Festival. This food festival is as big and exciting as the city that inspired it. All weekend, there have been food tastings, live cooking demonstrations and more just down the block in Bryant Park. There are the nights, seven evenings of exclusive dinners at 10 of our restaurant critic Pete Wells' favourite restaurants, and here in the Time Centre, the talks, a series of discussions from the most interesting and vital voices in today's food scene. Following today's talk, we invite you to stay, enjoy a free cup of coffee from Joe in the lobby, and visit our festival lounge downstairs. There you can grab a drink at the festival bar, watch the talks live streamed, and enjoy a scoop of the flavor of record, an ice cream created by the Times and Ample Hills Creamery, and much, much more. I'd like to give a special thanks to the New York Times Food Festival sponsors, our presenting sponsor MasterCard, our major sponsor Uber Eats, our wellness sponsor Yogi Tea, our event sponsors Bullet, Don Julio and Smirnoff Seltzer, our NYT cooking stage sponsor Sub-Zero Wolf and & Cove, and our supporting sponsors AARP of New York, Badia Spices, Resi, Joe Coffee and REI. And I'd like to especially thank Deloitte, who have supported this talk and introduce Bonnie Cantor, Managing Director of Deloitte, to just say a few words. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Bonnie Cantor, I'm Managing Director at Deloitte, and I get the privilege of welcoming you to this amazing event. While Deloitte uh, may be known more for data analytics and auditing uh, than culinary greatness, sustainability is a key focus and area of expertise for our firm. A sustainable food chain is important in many, many different ways, from the ability to enhance the health and welfare of people uh, to driving local employment. Food impacts everyone on the planet and can be, play a key role in business growth. At Deloitte, our teams work with organizations to help them see the possibility of how sustainability can transform their business and society. Hence, our support of today's Feed the World talk. And in addition to being a New York Times Food Festival sponsor, we're also proud sponsors of the James Beard Foundation an organization that shines the spotlight on the importance of food access, public health, and sustainability. I hope you enjoyed today's talk, and thank you. And now on to our program. These days, it's almost impossible to talk about food without touching upon its impact on society, politics, culture, and much more. But how much can we really change? We are honored to have Massimo Bottura, chef of Osteria Francescana, the two-time winner of the world's 50 best award, and Ruth Reichel, former Times restaurant critic, gourmet editor, and author here on stage to discuss. Please welcome them to the Time Center stage, along with our NYT cooking columnist, Melissa Clark. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. This talk, especially, is one of the most important ones. I mean, they're all important. <laughs> but to have these two together on stage to talk about how to feed the world, I think, is a moment that we should all mark and listen really carefully to what they have to say. So thank you both for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Massimo, you flew in just for this. You're here for 20 hours just to talk to <laughs> us. So, no. you know, that's, that's really, that's commitment. I said, I, said, I said before behind the scene, when I hear someone say, I'm too busy, I can't come, you know, I'm like, okay, uh, you know, if you want to be there, you're going to be there. Yeah. So if you want to cook there, you, we're going to cook together. together. Not, no excuses, no more excuses. That's it. Right. And you, you never make them. Uh, so I want to ask you, you know, right now we're seeing a trend of chefs becoming activists, social activists. And I want to ask you personally, you know, there you are. You have your restaurants. You have your beautiful Francescana. You have 
a lot of recognition from the world. What made you decide that you needed to take your career in another direction and do social activism? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It was such a... Okay, wait. <laughs> Get comfortable. We have a lot Get to talk about. Get comfortable, yeah. So, uh, I grew up in a place called Emilia Romagna. It's in the middle of the food valley. And uh, it's a place where um, we are kind of social. We learned since we were kids that if you stay together, your voice can be louder. And uh, stay together, we save uh, the balsamic vinegar, Parmigiano Reggiano, all these kind of product because we create consorti, so it means the, the union of all these uh, families, because it's all fam about families, that they stay together. And we uh, create all together like this kind of uh, important impact on gastronomy and food. We grew up, I always say, you know, uh, in my vein, there's balsamic vinegar, <laughs> and my, my muscles are made by Parmigiano Reggiano. <laughs> you know, uh, but uh, it, it is true. You know, I grew up even with my grandmother that was always whispering on my ears, don't leave the table if you don't finish the food. Because it's like, uh, you, you have to remember that uh, we had, uh, we didn't have anything once, and uh, we were like eating polenta, touching the polenta with a ring in the middle of the table. Mm -hmm. So we were eating polenta and a ring, but just the, the, the memory of an ring, <laughs> because right. the, there is, was just an ring. So with the polenta, you were touching the fish and eat, and uh, imagine to eat polenta and a ring, just that polenta. And so this is kind of approach that is like so important, or where you were we were like the 8th of December in the country, killed a pig, and the pig was giving the, the, the life to the family. The pig has a name, that it, and it was part of the family. But, you know, and, and it, it, my grandmother was always saying, it's an act, very spiritual action. You have to be respectful of what you do and use every single bones of the animals that is giving the life for the family. So once you have this kind of approach, is um, is normal that uh, you're gonna uh, uh, transfer this kind of uh, uh, this uh, this uh, attitude to all uh, your team, your staff, because your staff is your family, and uh, and uh, because you pass most most of the time with that. So Lara, Charlie, Alexa are my family, yeah. but my large family is the team of Osteria Francescana. And what we, we are doing every day, we are 82 people, and we are feeding uh, 30 cover at, at lunch and 30 at dinner. So we feed 60 people every day. They come from all over the world. But we are 82, so we have to feed 160 meals to the staff meal. And so it, it, it's the approach we have with all these different preparation that we do uh, in our uh, osteria, like we not we 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 don't waste any single uh, bread uh, piece of bread because the bread is talking to us because bread is part of our life because uh, you know we have learned that we have to talk with the ingredients we have to ask so tomato how do you feel <laughs> you know are you just picked or you're overripe so if you talk with the tomato the tomato is going to tell you what to do, you know, and the tomato is going to answer to you. You know, if the piece of bread is just baked, beautiful, smelly, beautiful bread, you know, you can serve at the table and break it and share with people. If it's two days old, you can, um, you know, make panzanella, squeeze some tomato or like whatever, and, uh, or, or papal pomodoro or whatever. If it's like five days old, you can grate and make breadcrumbs and make breadcrumbs noodles. Yes, I was which, making which we make together. In your kitchen, yes. you know, like mixing nothing, mixing a little bit of Parmigiano, a little bit of a um, couple of eggs, the uh, breadcrumbs, mix it, squeeze in, uh, into a potato squeezer, into a chicken uh, broth, and make passatelli. That is the best uh, and most. Uh, uh, warm meal, uh, that uh, my, my f favorite meal of Charlie and Alexa. So this is the way and right. the attitude. And so what we did, we brought this idea 
to the universal exposition. Universal exposition team was feed the planet, energy for life. So we decided to feed the planet our own way. Um, every single state came to me uh, and asked for, like, to set the party for the 4th of July, uh, the Presa de la Bastilla, the French, uh, whatever. But no one asked really what I was thinking about feed the planet. So I decided to do it by myself and knock at the right door and uh, the, 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 the church uh, gave me this, uh, because in my mind I had this uh, idea of create a refectorio. You all know about this, right? We were going to ask, so let's tell okay. them about it. So okay, you know, this, was in, this was in Milan. Okay, don't worry about that. So this was in Milan originally. This was in Milan during the Universal Exposition. And so there you are and you're seeing the, uh, an amazing amount of food waste, right? And you're seeing... It, it's like numbers are there. Right. The numbers are there. We are 12 billion people on Earth. We, are, uh, uh, we produce food for 12 billion people. We are 7 billion on Earth. We waste 1.3 billion tons of food every year. That means 33% of the production is wasted. It's like, it's insane. We use water, human capital, energy, to produce food and then we burn it. We are like, there are 860 million people on earth, they don't have anything to eat. And so there you so are, you're, you're seeing all of this like- and, and Feed the planet means fighting food waste. And fighting food waste in our way is like also, means involves so many different aspects. But first of all, as I said many times, this is a cultural project. This is in your mind, not waste food. That to, for me is not food waste, it's surplus. So, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and I've learned during many conversation that we waste, uh, we, uh, Google had like this uh, enormous uh, uh, search on, and, and you know, we waste food, first of all, in our home. So this is what we do, is like, we trying to give, set an example, as like the title, no? Like, best chef in the world is opening a soup kitchen in the most neglected neighbor in Milan. You know, it's like, wow. And that, that, was, was, the first, big... that was the first refettorio. Yeah, that was the first refettorio in Milan. And so you, there you are, you, and you're seeing a lot of waste, especially because there's an exposition there, right? And that's where you have a lot of particular, you have food service and you, you're seeing it just wasted and you're thinking, I'm gonna take all that food and I'm gonna bring it to, you brought it to, a, it was a church, it was an old? It, it was um, an old um, uh, space. It was an old theater from 1930 in the most neglected neighborhood in Milan. And, um, full of dust and rats. Um, and uh, so in uh, one year, we rebuilt this old space. Uh, thanks for, uh, to the architects, the designer, the artists, because I always thought to involve uh, all these uh, subjects that talk about creativity and beauty. Because in my mind, I thought that beauty uh, was something very special. It's always been something special. Like mentioning Camus, you know, with beauty you don't know yeah. do the revolution, yeah. but one day the revolution will need the beauty. So one day when you, do, when you did the revolution, you need beauty to rebuild. And beauty, I've learned, that uh, really help us to rebuild the dignity of the people. Right. So what we did one week before the opening, we have, was checking the whole uh, list of the volunteers. They sign, and there were so many volunteers, hundreds and hundreds of volunteers, so I said, okay, let's change everything. I don't wanna do anymore this old uh, way of serving in a soup kitchen with uh, you know, the tray, everyone in line, like this, put the food in there. No, that's not what we want to do. We want to create amazing meals with, for people sitting at the table, for volunteers, they were saying, welcome. Welcome, people. Enjoy your dinner. And so the aesthetics. And, uh, and, you know, and thanks to the chef, they brought the beauty of their creativity, their time, their uh, imagination, to, to turn the surplus food 
to amazing meals. So this was something that was so powerful, but so incredibly well received by all these guys that, you know, two weeks later, they became gastronomic critics. <laughs> you know, it's like, no, they, it's not a joke. You know, yeah, they were no, like, right. they look at Duca, Alain Ducasse, you know, like the French uh, with the, you know, like this attitude. <laughs> Are there some French here? <laughs> yeah. You know, you know how Ducasse is. You know, you're not French. Oui, bien sûr, je suis français. And, you know, and these guys, they were playing jokes with them. And they said, but the food, uh, you know, like, we want to eat some pasta. You know, they were in Italy. <laughs> you know, and they were serving soups and soups. And, and so, you know, it's like, it's crazy how, how everything uh, exploded in our hands. But we didn't know exactly what to expect. We jumped. You know, it was totally unexpected, this amazing, you know, f uh, feedback that we had. And uh, one day after the Universal Exposition, uh, I received a text message from, uh, uh, you know, at five in the morning, uh, and, and uh, Lara turned to me and he said, who's texting you at five in the morning? <laughs> I said, the mayor of Rio de Janeiro. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what does he want, the mayor of Rio de Janeiro at five in the morning? He wants the refectorio in Rio de Janeiro. And said, and what did you answer? Why not? <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly you, why not? Yes, that is why not? So Ruth, when you first heard about what Massimo was doing, um, it, was, it was revolutionary, but it was also such a simple concept. What was your first thought, and how did you change how you thought about it as you saw him grow? Um, you know, I'm just thinking how much things have changed in the 50 years yeah. I've been writing about food. And Massimo just explained this in one way. Because 50 years ago, when I started writing about food, when you went to a chef and asked for a comment, you got kind of yes or no. <laughs> <laughs> you, you did not get this kind of articulate vision. Um, so what has happened in the ensuing time is chefs themselves have changed enormously. You know, we now have these incredibly bright, visionary, articulate men and women who are running kitchens. And if you run a kitchen, you can't not think about the contradiction that you are putting out beautiful food for very rich people. And it, it bothers you that in a world where you know, half the people in the world go hungry, it, it hurts you. I mean, sh people who care about food are generous. I mean, hunger is, is all of our issue. This is very important. Yeah. And yeah. Um, <laughs> chefs didn't used to think about that. They just sort of put their heads down and cooked. And then, I mean, I started noticing over time, you know, I mean, I remember in the 80s, having discussions with Wolfgang Puck about how much food was going to waste and that, you know, three miles away there were people who were hungry and how could they get the food from one place to another? And you started seeing, um, you know, various organizations grow up to like try City and Harvest. deal. City Harvest. City Harvest and other yeah. organizations. Um, and, you know, SOS, start, which is a chef based organization started thinking about it. But when Massimo did this, it was like a huge leap from let's just gather the food to how do we take all of our ingenuity, all of the things that we're most passionate about and make it a beautiful experience for people? How do we get, you know, we please people every day. And that, that, that's what we try and do. We're in the pleasure business, right? How do we take this and change it from something that is a kind of um, alms for the poor, right? Um, to something where we say, we want you to experience food in the way that we do, and maybe that will change you in some way. I mean, it's, it's a very ambitious idea. It's true. It is true. You were talking that, a lot that about was dignity. Happened. That was happened. Yeah. That exactly what happened. You know, it's like, first of all, no one chef, and I'm talking about the most influential chef in the world, said no. They flew from everywhere, you know, just because they were, oh, they were at the Universal Exposition or whatever. You know, they arrive and they cook. 
and they left with tears in their hearts, you know? It was amazing, and they were asking to come back. In London, uh, like the, uh, the London, uh, the chef from the, the city, you know, they were like, they are sending, till, uh, still now, uh, kids or uh, employees or stagiaires to, in their day, day off, to cook at the refectorio there. Uh, in Paris, it was like all the three Michelin star from France, they arrive and they cook. So it's like, and more than that, as I was like enjoying what she was saying, uh, you know, and Ruth was like, is like one of the things that was more important is like, is like the beauty of the place that really changed the old neighborhood. That now, Greco, that was like the most neglected neighbor, we were there two days ago with the Chinese That's television, the That's the neighbor Milan, in Milan. Yeah. Was like you couldn't walk into because it was like a place for drug dealers, like like it was insane. Now is the most amazing place where all this new construction, the people. But the most amazing thing is that the people they were protesting, the neighbor they were protesting against the opening of a soup kitchen because they were they were saying like they were fighting for their own small apartment, you know. They are now part of the community, so it's like it's we we brought light in the middle of the neighborhood, and the light make all the bad people, you know, living, and you we brought you know, beauty, the sense of being together, we empower the, the whole community, the whole community is part of this, uh, they are all uh, um, uh, volunteers, they are cleaning uh, the old neighborhood, it's unbelievable, it's unbelievable. In exactly what happened in, uh, in, uh, in every place that we create. Uh, so how many do you have right now? Right now we are seven and one is opening now in, in, uh, in Mexico, in, uh, in the, the old city of Merida, in the UNESCO protected downtown of Merida. The Chapur family uh, uh, is renewing a, a convent that was abandoned and in the convent is going to be uh, the, our refectorio. A changing room for the people. They can take shower, changing the clothes, and uh, and uh, from the people of Madeira, they donate. So we have like a, a washing machines. They're like so they can yeah they can really refresh themselves before coming and eat uh, other things. And it's going to be even in Mexico a cooking school because this is another part of the, our project. Inside the refectorio, we start. The first one was in Brazil. Uh, there was a, we created a cooking school in the back of the refectorio in which uh, we were inviting the, um, we were focusing on women, the women out of the favelas, out of poverty, teaching them uh, a job and, uh, you know, giving them an opportunity for the future. And one of them became uh, a, a star in, uh, oh, really? in uh, yeah. And, um, this is David's project? Yeah, is 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 yeah. David asked uh, to bring the refectory project in there, so gastromotiva, and uh, you know it's it's amazing. And uh, you know, like in in in, in um, Bologna too, um, this family Bologna is focused on uh, refugees and migrants' families, but families. So it's very easy because uh, when you have kids around. Everything is so easy to do it because it's party every night, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and uh, people like kids are running, come in the kitchen, sneak, uh, steal uh, chocolate and whatever, and um, you know. But one of, and we we create a, a cooking project, cooking school project, and um, now uh, a family from Peru, migra the migrants from Peru. Uh, they they became now uh, John Jonathan is the head chef at the refectorio in uh, he couldn't find a job you know a permanent job you know and uh, he did this jo this uh, this um, program and he signed for the program and he graduated and uh, now is the head chef at the refectorio in Bologna. Wow, I mean, the thing that's so great about this is is the idea of it is so expansive. I mean, the idea is that. 
food is more than something to eat. Yes. It, it's food, food is a force in the world. And how do we use this? And so it's not just you know, about waste or sustainability. I mean, it's, really, it's about connections, and it's about thinking about food in the broadest sense and thinking about hunger in the broadest sense. So, I mean, and it's expanding the idea of what a restaurant can be. You had once said that, 10, that you wanted 10,000 of these across the world, and you didn't want anyone even to notice that they were there because you wanted yeah, them I to thought, become... I thought 1,000, but it's okay. I even, oh, yeah. <laughs> maybe I exaggerated a little bit. But the idea was that it was going to become no, so but, part of but culture. What, right? But I want to connect yeah. with, that, yeah. with that, because uh, we just opened Casa Maria Luisa. You're going to come and experience in two weeks. So, you know, we opened Casa Maria Luisa. We didn't know what to do with this, you know, country place. And, but at it's the end, so beautiful. And, and, you know, but at the end, we decided to create in the carry space these, put three, these uh, three tables, last minute. We had three tables exactly as we had in Milan. And uh, <coughs> so what we decide? We decide to bring back, first of all, in the world in which people building walls, you know you have a president that loves walls. <laughs> you know, a, a, in, a, in a world in which people wants to build walls, we break walls. And we do whatever we know what to do the best. <laughs> like, we open our arms and we say, welcome. Welcome, everyone. And, uh, and especially the Italians that I'm talking all the time with all the politics and the people, like, they're like migrants from the 120 years. They go everywhere to find a place to, to work. Uh, you know, we, did, we, we didn't have, we were, we were poor, and, you know, and now they are complaining. So the point is, we, we, open, we put these three tables. We broke the walls, we opened the kitchen. We are cooking in front of the people, and we invite people to sit around the table and share a table on the fine dining experience. But, now there's a very interesting story. But, you know, so we didn't know what to expect, because, you know, like, we ask you to, we brought the concept of the refettorio inside the fine dining. Before, we, like, we brought the, the, the concept of the staff meal inside the refettorio. Now, we are bringing what we have learned, the most powerful things that you just mentioned, of sharing a meal around the table all together into the fine dining. Wow, what's going to be? I don't know. We, we jump, as usual. So, first three service, amazing. Very easy, but mild, uh, very good. Then Saturday night, first Saturday. One table, eight people from United States. <laughs> first two, <laughs> no, it, <laughs> first two, two, <laughs> two very liberal from Boston. <laughs> the second two, two very Republican from Texas, <laughs> sitting close to the other. The other four people, four friends from Boulder, Colorado. <laughs> they were smoking pots in the park the whole <laughs> afternoon. So imagine when they approach to the table how they were like. And then they sit close to the two Republicans from Texas. I said, oh my god, tonight is going to explode the bomb inside the refectory, the, like uh, the Maria Luisa, whatever. Guys, at the end of the meal, these eight people made a reservation, reservation next year, same people, same table, same day. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the power of sharing a meal around the table. Eating a meal together around the table, sharing, talk to each <laughs> other, leave your phone on the side, and talk to people is exactly what you were saying. It's much more than simple food. It's touching your heart. It's touching you know, the, the cord of the unexpected. And you open yourself. And this is the way you know, we are expanding, and we are trying to, un to, uh, trying to feed the people in the world, you know? We're trying to move uh, a ref the refectorio experience into every single dark place to bring light and make everyone, you know, shine, you know? Yeah. This I is the way. 
And what you were saying um, about opening a thousand of them that nobody should notice, and I love this because what it, what still, you were saying is that it should become so much part of culture yeah. that it's not exceptional anymore. Yeah. It's not, this is just part of every city. And I want to talk about that too, like culture, how you change culture, the culture. You said, yeah, culture is the right word, yeah. you know? Culture is the most important word. It's like the chef of the future that has to start with culture. Culture is the most important ingredient for a chef of the future. You know, with culture, it opens up so many possibilities, and it's like you're gonna be, you're gonna be much more sens sensitive uh, on things and uh, open mind. Um, cultural project means. It, our is not a charity project. Our is a cultural project. That's why we communicate. That's why we need to talk with as many people as we can, because we have to feed the people with culture, with the idea that wasting food is not acceptable in 2019. And uh, the c culture is the culture of my grandmother who didn't have anything to eat growing up with, uh, yeah, to raise a family. Culture means, um, you know, to, to um, communicate this, communicate how uh, the most uh, amazing chef in the world, they can uh, you know, approach and load in the track in the morning and cook what, whatever they have. You know? And uh, we, that's why we, we, we create a book, uh, uh, like Bread is Gold, that's why we communicate, we do conference, and now you see, you, you, I have this perception, we were talking in the backstage, you know, everybody are talking about this, this, uh, this uh, project and about uh, food waste. And this is because we were like, we keep communicate, communicate, sharing, sharing, this is very important. Let's talk about your book for a minute, Bread is Gold, because I think it's, it's actually really important. You had, were just saying that food waste happens in every kitchen, in every place. It's not just part of the restaurant industry. It's not part of um, you know, corporate industries. It's part of our own habits. Um, and I know, Ruth, I know that this is something that you also have been thinking a lot about, um, and you've written a lot about as, as well personal responsibility for each one of us. And so you wrote this book, right, which is going to, which shows us how to be better stewards of our own ingredients. Do you want to talk a little bit yeah. about that? The, uh, the book was, uh, uh, is extremely important because uh, it's telling you um, how you can really approach to food, as I, I was saying in the beginning, looking at the food and, uh, you know, understand uh, I have a good. I have a good story. You always do. You know, <laughs> this is this is uh, this is okay. 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 I'm, no, no, I'm, no. I'm trying to focus because otherwise I'm gonna get lost in all story my too, though. <laughs> ideas. You know, like okay, I'm focusing on your question. So, <laughs> so the book was like it's about uh, you know it's about raising money uh, for for food for soul to open these things. It's about communicate what you can do. It's about uh, open the mind of the people, yeah, especially the big companies like Google, that uh, it, they look at the, at the book and they approach us, the, the, the girls from Food for Soul, and they said, so what we can do together, we can create a platform, you know, where all these hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of recipe that we create uh, from uh, Milan uh, to Rio de Janeiro to Paris, London, Bologna, Naples, you know, we can, they can be uh, storage in this uh, platform, each one of, of us can go Google and, uh, and find uh, a solution for some uh, food waste, you know, to fight food waste. So this is the approach that we want. We want to communicate. We want to change the mind of the, of the especially the young generation. Uh, but uh, I, I have this kind of super positive feeling because I have this kind of, uh, I'm reaching, I've been reached by so many young uh, um, kids uh, and uh, and teens and uh, cooks and uh, you know th they they really love the project they really embrace the project but you know once you learn uh, from uh, I am the first one who has to learn uh, especially when uh, when you have uh, you have to confront uh, f for example. Um, the, you are, you, I was approaching to create a pesto, like, a la Genovese, no? with basil, classic things. 
But uh, you know, the, the day before, I didn't. Uh, uh, they use a lot of basil that I've seen that they, after, you know, that I seen in the refrigerator. So I had to confront what I can do because I promised all these guests to have pasta and pesto the day after. So what I did, I was like, okay, what I can mix with pesto. So I connect with my mental palate, and I understand <laughs> that the basil is matching perfectly with mint, and especially if it's July, and is matching perfectly with thyme, but not with rosemary and sage. So I put together the three, and I create the pesto with uh, uh, basil, mint, and thyme. But uh, <clears throat> at one point, I didn't have a pine nuts, because they are too expensive. I couldn't go out and buy pine nuts because I promised that. So what I did, I, I switched pine nuts with uh, breadcrumbs, and it came out as such an amazing pesto, much lighter than with the pine nuts, and the people loved it. This was, is, is an example. But the second example was in Brazil. I've learned in Milan how to work with the, the bananas peel. And uh, especially the brown bananas. You know the four more wasted f food are bread, bananas, milk, and salad. Milk and what? Banana, bread, salad, and, salad. And, uh, and, uh, and milk. So what I did, you know, I was in Brazil. You know Brazil is wasting 55% of the production? 55! Of bananas specifically? Uh, in of, general. Oh, of everything. Food, yeah, oh of everything. Okay. Every day, in Rio de Janeiro, 11, fo 11 tracks food, full of food and, uh, fruit and vegetables are burned because it's more expensive to, uh, to distribute the food to the 2.5 million people they don't have anything to eat than burn it. So they burn it. They don't care about climate change. They don't care about anything. They do it. So this is crazy. So we had this old kitchen full of bananas every day. You know, and, and all these uh, volunteers, they were cleaning bananas. And I said, what are you going to do with all that bananas? <laughs> you, know, you know, OK. So I said, OK, guys, for the opening, I'm going to make carbonara. So I was kind of safety because I brought with me guanciale, you know, like just as a simple, uh, you know, simple things to just pay tribute to all these people. And, uh, and serve carbonara, make sure that, uh, you know, uh, some Italian uh, icons. But I don't know why the, someone decided to use uh, the, my guanciale for staff <laughs> meal. You know, so the day I was there to make like the carbonara, I wasn't without guanciale. So I, what, what, what am I supposed to do? So what I did, I've learned in Milan from uh, the, the, this amazing Katia Barbosa, this amazing woman from the favelas of Rio de Janeiro, how to work with uh, banana peels. So what I did, I had just left this piece of guanciale. So I blanched the banana peels. I, OK, uh, are you interested in this? Yes, 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 <laughs> okay, yes good. very much. Good. Uh, you know, I, I blanched the banana peels. Then I toasted them in the oven. Then uh, once, once they were very toasted, I cut it as they were like cubes of, uh, of uh, guanciale. Then what I did, the, what the guanciale left, I put it in a, in a, in a, in a classic uh, gastro from uh, the oven, you know, and I sliced the guanciale very thin on the top of the, all uh, the banana peels that are already toasted. And put in the oven, I melt the guanciale on the top of the banana peels. Then I took all the, the gastro outside, inside this piazza, in front of the, the, the refettorio, I started these smoke things, that handmade smoke stuff. That were, I was smoking the old neighborhood, like with this kind of <laughs> crazy stuff. I put all the banana peels there, and I smoked the banana peels. You were tasting. It was like guanciale. You know, then I make the carbonara with the banana peels. <laughs> and no one journalist, you know, gourmet, they were inviting at the opening, recognized banana peels from Guanciale. <laughs> so I, most, I made the most perfect carbonara you can ever imagine with banana peels. Oh my God. So that's why, you know, like, that's how you, you create things, you know? 
Oh my God, that's amazing. Yeah. But the, and a very important exercise that I did in that moment when we were working with banana was the way to teach the volunteers how to taste. Yeah. Because most of the time you don't know how to taste the flavor. So they were making sorbetto with bananas and I was tasting and I tasted and I said, it doesn't taste anything, it tastes just sugar. You know, but how much sugar did you put with these bananas? They said, 50%. I said, 50%, it's disgusting. It's killing your body, you know? 50% of sugar with brown bananas. You don't need anything. So let's try this exercise all together. Let's put these bananas and make it with 30%. You have 50%, we make one with 30, one with 10, and one with 0% of sugar. You know, you use the most amazing banana you ever taste, you like brown bananas. They are unbelievable. They're melting in the palate with such a, wow, explosive taste. Then we start tasting from 50 to zero, and they learn how to make a sorbet with those amazing brown bananas with 0% of sugar. So this kind of exercise teach you also how to feed people in good and healthy food, you know, not just fried and sodas and things. But when you taste, you know, a espresso, for example, you taste an espresso, most of the time, the Italians are so nostalgic, they don't understand that the, the espresso they are drinking like this, is just burn shit. <laughs> and you know, and I, I'm saying, you know, why you have to you drink an espresso like that? You know, just taste what you have in the palate. You know, the exercise is very simple. Get a still water on the side. Okay, but don't tell anyone, don't write what I'm saying. Eh? <laughs> because they're gonna kill me. When I'm going back to Italy, they're gonna kill me. So don't, don't tell anyone, eh? Don't tell anyone. It's Off gonna stay the record. here. Off what the what record, is said people. in New York stays in New York, okay? <laughs> okay, okay. Close all the doors. <laughs> I want everyone to sign uh, this. Okay, so what they do, like, take like a small glass of still water. Drink the espresso and drink the still water. You realize what you have in the palate. If you have like beautiful almond, toasted, incense, chocolate, uh, you know, hazelnut, that's a good espresso. You know, when, because the beans are being toasted very well, like treated very well, etc. If you taste just burned stuff, that means it's robusta. Even if it's like very creamy, because robusta gives a lot of creaminess, if it's very creamy, but it's like, you don't have anything in the palate, it's just burned stuff. So it's like, it's very important to, to stimulate your palate and understand what you are eating, you know? So I think all of you probably have some questions that we wanna ask Ruth and, and Massimo. So we're gonna, we have some mics on the side. We're gonna start lining up. I'm gonna ask you Easy one- Easy question, eh? <laughs> <laughs> we don't have a time for a lot of them, but if anyone wants to ask some questions, we're gonna start in a minute. And then if this we guy. can- Well, uh, no, no, we're lining up at the mics. So I, if you wanna I, ask a question- I, I saw that he's- uh, Okay, um, but we're not gonna be able to hear him. So- Okay, whatever. <laughs> do you mind going up to, like, can you get out? Let him out, let the, let the gentleman out, yeah. And we're gonna line up at the mics and ask questions. Um, if we can turn the lights, just so I can see everybody at, who are- Not okay. just from that side. Yeah, we've got both side. sides. So you see there's a mic over there. Anyone wants to ask? All right, but we're gonna start over, we're gonna start over here. Hello, um, I was wondering, as a cook, I work a full-time job, I go and I, help another friend's restaurant out on my weekends. How do you get other, how do you get fine dining cooks to make the time to volunteer when they're trying to work and get the work-life balance as well? Cook is an act of love. So it's not good or like fine dining or bad dining is like, you can cook good food yeah. or bad food takes the same time. So if you know how to cook, <laughs> you know, it's like, is, am I right? You know, you know, if you overcook some, you know, I'm telling you a story about uh, Chang, the chef de partia d'Osteria Francescana who cook the pasta meal for, for everyone in Italy, you know, in my restaurant. He overcooked the pasta all the time because Chinese have this kind of approach. It's amazing. But it starts a very big discussion about how to eat pasta 
too al dente, not al dente, medium, and this. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, Chang is a super smart guy, and he's like, is, okay, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> the question was, how do you find the time? You want to okay. volunteer, but how do you balance it? I don't know. Maybe that, maybe Ruth should take a stab at that one. Ruth. <laughs> you, you can, okay, go back to seat. seat. <laughs> it's a okay, good we said easy gentleman. questions. <laughs> this gentleman. <laughs> you're going to find the time. If I find the time to come here, you're going to find the time to w go and come uh, in our new refectorio that we're going to open in New York and, uh, and uh, work with us, you know? Yeah. For sure you're going to find it. It's all here. You know, you feel it inside uh, and you do it. Because uh, as she said before, cooking, ki, who does this kind of job? That is the most stressful, incredible stressful job in the world. You know, it's, be, it's because we love it and because we are born to give. So you, the day off, you're going to come and you're going to experience it once. Then you're going to want to come twice and three times. And then it's like normal. Is, this is the way. OK. OK, hey, good afternoon. Hi. Uh, I actually have two questions. Uh, I think the first one was, could you talk maybe around the challenges that you faced in setting up the refectorio? And I'm the, sorry? The challenges uh, that you faced in setting up the refectorio, you know, what yeah. were the biggest yes. uh, challenges and yes. the challenges that you foresee in the future? And the second point was around sustainability of the refectorio when you rely on the volunteers, or if you're changing the face of a neighborhood, for example, and gentrification, just if you could talk about that. Okay. Thank you. So the, the challenge was incredible, because uh, that was in the beginning. So now it's easy, because everybody knows about the project. And uh, you know, just this morning, we receive a mail. Jill is here with me. And we receive a mail from Portugal. They have the space. We receive a mail from Chicago. They almost have the space. So just this morning. So everybody wants to help us, and uh, everybody wants to help. And uh, you know, it, it's, it's going to be. It's not. It's not easy. You know, because it's like you need the right partner because of the real estate, uh, especially in places like New York or San Francisco. They're very expensive, but you know, um, the, it's much easier. But uh, when I first approached uh, in for Milan, no one. But I swear, no one understood what I was, what I want, what I had in mind. But not even Lara, my wife. She was saying, you know, we fight all these years to create, you know, this restaurant. You're gonna, you know, you're gonna, they're gonna kill you. You know, I said, don't worry, we'll do it, we'll do it. But now it's easy to say, ah, oh, it was a good idea. At that time, everybody thought, you know, a cook from Via Stella in the small town of Modena who wants to create a, a pavilion at the Universal Exposition outside the Universal Exposition. That was crazy. But that was the key. Because first, I had in mind the miracle in Milan at the train station in Milan. But the Pope said, no, it's better to bring light in the periphery. Because the periphery is where they need the light, not center the train station in Milan. Because the, the, from 1950, it really changed the old perspective. So we brought the light, we, we brought the project in the Quartiere Greco, no? close the refugees' uh, house, and um, in the uh, safety place called, uh, um, is, a, is, a, is a, a place where the kids, they can play, is, is like a kid's, uh, you know, how many? Question. You know, <laughs> you know, we may not get to all of them. Don't worry. <laughs> you know, like uh, we we recreate this old neighborhood, and uh, it's like it's it's beautiful. So um, it was like it's. Uh, we did it, we did it, I don't know, you know, you get the right feeling. Now, if you wanna do it, you, you meet with Jill, and she's gonna push you and organize you, and, uh, and uh, create a, a refectorio in uh, Buenos Aires, or you know, in Tokyo for 2020 at the Olympics, you know? But this is a, a, a very important approach. And then the second question was? The second question was around sustainability, right? How, yeah, how to make sure each that one of the refectorio has his own uh, idea. Because uh, the real heroes of this project is not me. It's the, the people, like the organization, they take care of their everyday life. So in Paris, what they did, uh, the mayor of Paris and the archbishop of Paris gave us the crypt of La Madeleine. 
So the, the, the big La Madeleine, uh, one of the most iconic places in Paris, uh, we are in there. We are in the crypt. We brought light in the crypt. And, uh, you know, so we created a, a popular restaurant, very, very cheap, like affordable, like 15, 20 euros every day, and it's packed. And uh, so we make the money to sustain. London is such a beautiful space that uh, companies rent the space and pay a lot of money to support uh, the refettorio and, uh, you know, rent the space. Uh, each one of them uh, has uh, his own... Uh, idea, and David with Gastromotiva is a, has a cooking school, has a small restaurant, he sells uh, the, the space for events, so that's the, way, the idea of uh, be sustainable. And uh, you know, the food, we have so much waste that, you know, one thing that we didn't say that is very important, like we gave such a big example uh, at the Universal Exposition in Milan, that Italy and France, two important, two of the most important cuisine in the world, you know? So that's why they understood immediately the project. They passed a law against food waste, inspired by us. So think about that. We were, a cook from Via Stella in Modena is inspiring, but no, 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 not just me, everybody. We inspire like the politicians to pass the law against food waste. You know, the other week we were with, uh, with uh, at the, I was invited at the United Nations to talk at the United Nations for the, uh, the climate change week. And uh, Angela Merkel, when she saw me, she like, hi, so how was everything doing? Because she was so into this project too. She was supporting, like Barack Obama, asked me to go to Palm Spring to talk at the round table about all the implication that this project has. So it's like, we, there's a lot of things to do, but we, already, we, are, we are already there, no? And the thing that's so inspiring about this generation of chefs is they do the impossible. They just, you know, Jose Andres goes to Puerto Rico with a credit card and yes. says, I know how to feed people. And you know, I hope there are people in this room who will just do the impossible because yeah. it can be done and they're yeah. proving that it can Jose, be done. Jose has a very, very important project. He's working with the food bank since a long time and he's the first, uh, uh, he's like 911, you know? I'm coming and he's going with all these he creates. For us it's like he's more cultural and uh, spread and you know, focus on food waste climate change, all these goals of the United Nations. Thank, Thank you, you for that. Okay. Yeah. Okay, this is gonna be, um, I'm, we're gonna just do you, and then we're gonna do you, and that's all we're gonna have time for. Oh, Sorry. come on, Sorry. Melissa, uh, don't be so. We gotta so stick to the schedule, come on. stick to the schedule. And oh, wait, wait, wait. I love that guy, look at, look at the last one. Wait, 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 I have to tell He's you something. so young. <laughs> I have to tell you something, though. Listen to this. This is very exciting. Massimo is going to be signing books right outside. I'm not signing anything. He's if signing you're... everything. No, no, no. But everyone can ask his, their questions directly to him and come meet him in person. And he would love to talk to you, as you, you obviously can see. But, it was but he has a come. plane to catch. I have to, I have to catch a plane. <laughs> but no, but we'll have time. There'll be more time for questions outside after this. So, you know, keep them coming. But for now, we're going to do, do you. And then we're going to do <laughs> then we're gonna do you. So... Uh, uh, I've been very lucky to be a volunteer many times at the Refettorio in Paris, so it's a fantastic experience for... It's, what I want to say is a fantastic experience for the guests, of course, but also for all the people who volunteer. It really changed my, my vision. And now I moved back to New York, so I'm a bit sad. So I wanted to know, and you started to answer a bit about this, what are your plans in the US and in New York City specifically? Yeah. All right. Okay, close the door. <laughs> close the door. Again, close all the off door. the record. Don't talk with the New York Times, okay? <laughs> we are already planning in uh, New York. We were planning since two years ago to open in, in the Bronx. And, uh, but uh, we had some problems in there, too, too much talk. And uh, so I, I stepped back because I don't want to be manipulated. So uh, I want fresh and real souls that are part of this. And we met this, uh, this pastor 
uh, that is in Harlem, and uh, you know, and uh, he would love to be part of these old things. And uh, you know, I'm crazy about music. I'm crazy about art. Uh, we had a great uh, you know event uh, at uh, Red Rooster in May, and uh, so we are like. There's a, a lot of things uh, that are already there um, in Harlem, especially because he's on the other side of, uh, you know, I'm a, a brand ambassador with, uh, with Gucci, and uh, Dapper Dan uh, is working with the Gucci too, and he's on the other side of the street. So it's everything is connecting, and uh, they really are interesting in, uh, investing uh, in Food for Soul and help us to open Arlem and, uh, and uh, this amazing pastor that he really loves to sing. So it's gonna be like a repertorio <laughs> music theme. It's gonna, be, it's gonna be party every night. I'm, sh I'm sure, I'm sure it's gonna be party every night in New York. Oh, thank you for asking and, uh, that and, question. Uh, and the uh, uh, United States also, uh, we have Dina Powell of Goldman Sachs. We have uh, David Rosenberg of uh, uh, Amazon. Uh, Google is helping. Uh, Salesforce is trying to build the platform since a long time. Uh, you know, Salesforce, come on, man. You know, you know yeah, we need uh, a little bit of push, you know, because uh, with a platform, we can share with everybody who wants to join us. Uh, these kind of ideas, and maybe he wants to help, uh, where is he? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He wants to help and maybe do something, and we can help them very easily, you know, through that, you know, and connect all the people they believe in our project, you know, all over the world. So this is Thank what you. we are doing now. Thank you. We have a lot in the plate. But I want to hear the question from that guy. Come here. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Don't read. <laughs> Has to be an, they come, come. All right, while he's coming up, let her ask her question, then I promise we'll get to you. Because okay. you've been waiting patiently. Thank you both for being here. Look, look at this guy. Oh, he's going to be next. Cute. He's going to be next. Look how cute he is. Yes, yes, I agree. OK, I cool. Agree. He's going to be next, I swear. So oh, come I on. think Massimo would really like to hear this OK, question. let's do you. Sorry. What are you doing? You. Are you chewing? I had, a, I had a candy in my mouth, so oh. you go for it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Throw the candy. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> so I've been living in New York for about mm, six years now. Originally, I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and recently I took a trip home, and um, I've been witnessing my own local neighborhood undergo some pretty dramatic changes. Uh, the grocery store nearest to my home is about two to three miles away. But right up the street from where I live is a community garden. Uh, something I've been thinking about then is where my energy needs to go in terms of thinking about where the most critical structural change needs to occur. Is it empowering people to grow their own food or is it investing in the structural changes to increase food access and then decreasing food insecurity? This is a big question. Yeah. A few, yeah. <laughs> no, no, because, uh, because uh, you know, I have seen so many things in these years. You know, we went uh, to uh, Detroit, uh, um, uh, Denver, in the Hispanic community, they don't have any supermarket. You know, they share from house to house, you know, things. It's like, it's really shocking sometimes. Uh, you know, but, uh, you know, one thing that I, I'm thinking could be incredible. Maybe someone uh, that is going to be a millionaire one day here is going to help us uh, with this idea. You know, think about this. If we can put together all the surplus, maybe frozen food, maybe healthy, you know, things, but, you know, surplus food all together and distribute and create a, a free supermarket for people in need, that what maybe could be very interesting in those communities. I was thinking about that in, in, in Denver. You know, ask the guys, they really have you know, access to big uh, quantity of food that they are wasting a lot of stuff, to bring it in a free supermarket in which we invite people to come and get pe uh, food for free and, uh, you know, feed themselves, feed the family. 
with surplus food that is perfectly edible, amazing, you know, and especially in this Hispanic community, they, it's part of our Latinos' uh, attitude of, uh, you know, eat together, stay together, families, you know, that could be a very interesting idea for, to empower those kind of communities. Mm -hmm. But I don't know, it's like, it's very, it's very big, yeah. you know, and it's a big problem uh, here. Thank you. Ecco qua! <laughs> um, this might be an hour-long conversation, but um, like recently I was working, I was staging at a uh, two Michelin star restaurant and... Where? Uh, Midtown, I'm not going to say. But, um, uh, and they... You didn't say? You they didn't are... Say? I don't know, no, no, if you don't want to say, go back to... <laughs> so go. I was working at, at uh, I was staging at Aquavit. And huh? Aquavit. Aquavit. Okay. And I was, uh, I was really inspired by their menu, but I noticed that while I was watching the line cooks um, on the protein station, they are partnered with a lot of people who, um, like a lot of organizations who um, commit to like hunger and like, like those kind of organizations. And I noticed that they would, for their cod dish and their duck dish and their steak, they were trimming off the side so it would be like a perfect square. And they were just putting it to the side and throwing it to the garbage. And I was just- Why did you name the restaurant? <laughs> <laughs> so I just saw, I just saw those two, those two um, like things link up and I was just like, as a young cook, I was just confused. But the, um, this is exactly what uh, I, in the beginning when I was saying what we are doing in Osteria Francescana. This is the attitude that you have to have. You know, when you feed uh, your, all your employees, you know, mm, you know it's, there is so much food waste. This is waste. You know, that you can really, you know, there is a, there is a risotto, no? Uh, that we are cooking now. It's north that wants to be south. It's a, it's a risotto and polenta that wants to be a pizza. You know, what we do is like we cook, we ask the, no, no, it's true, is 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 the, we ask the buffalo mozzarella producer, like the best one is called Barlotti, to make buffalo mozzarella not of 500 grams, but 800, 900 grams with a lot of milk inside. So after 24 hours, the milk tastes like mozzarella because it's fermenting. And what we do, we put it inside a green uh, star and we separate the coagulated things with the milk. And we use the milk, just the milk to cook the risotto and to make it uh, taste like a buffalo mozzarella. You know, and under there you have a triple concentrate tomato, capers, anchovies, and the crust is the polenta that we make very thin and, uh, and um, smoke uh, and it tastes like the crust, the crust of the pizza, cornicione. But that kind of uh, mozzarella goes into the staff meal because every single Friday evening we have pizza party at the, at the restaurant. And uh, you know, Franceschetta, Maria Luisa, they all come and we eat pizza all together with that mozzarella that is a part of the food waste. So this is the approach you have to have. It's the approach uh, you to share with the people that are working there or you know, donate to the new Refettorio that we are opening there. <laughs> we know exactly oh, what be, to do. Be, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know where exactly. I'll be a volunteer. <laughs> you know where, what, Jill is there, Jill is there, down there. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh. oh, oh, perfect, perfect. Um, <laughs> you know, you see, he has the, the thing. Because he's like young, he's passionate, and he's, he was focusing about that. that. That's a good idea. Jill, hire him, hire him. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Come see Massimo after. He'll sign yeah. your book.